It's good to be reminded of God's love, is it not? A great love God has demonstrated to us that we would be the ones who would accuse him with our lips and he would be the, the one who would die for us. That's great news. Friends, if you don't know yet, Christmas is coming up. It's right around the corner. And often Christmas just causes me to go back and think about past years. How is it that it sneaks up on us every year? So this week I was just thinking, man, 35 Christmas I have seen. And I just started thinking as a child, the excitement of Christmas. Thinking of the excitement of receiving a gift. You see, I grew up with a mom that's very, that still is very frugal and wise when it comes to Christmas shopping. For my mom, Christmas shopping does not start the week before Christmas. Christmas shopping starts in January, right? And so we would receive several Christmas gifts that were collected throughout the year. Although we would receive one significant gift every year, my siblings and I, there were several gifts that were just simply things we needed. You know what those are. But my siblings and I would often try to guess what the special gift was according to the wrapping. Right? We'd look at the nicest wrapping. What's the shape of the thing I want? But wrappings, as you can probably expect, are often deceiving, right? So nice gifts sometimes come in ugly wrappings, and bad gifts come wrapped really well. So I remember once opening one of my gifts at Christmas, looking at a wrapping and saying, that's what I want. I'm sure that's my special gift. And I opened it. What I saw inside were plain white socks. My question was, is this a present or a punishment? Who gives children plain white socks for Christmas? You know, parents, word for the wise, don't give your children plain white socks for Christmas. Okay, socks for Christmas? Really? Really? Thankfully, that wasn't the only gift I received that year. And I did receive something else that I desired, that I wanted. Then I went to think about all the gifts that I received throughout the years. And I tried to think, what were some of the special things that I received as a child? What were some of the things that, were, that I so desired that my parents worked so hard to give me. You know how many things I could come up with? Zero. I do not recall any of the gifts that I so longed for as a child. The only thing that I could remember were plain white socks. And it's not because the gifts that I received were not meaningful and significant and thoughtful. I couldn't remember what I received because they were merely things. They were nothing but things. But is Christmas about things? Is Christmas about gifts? Things come and go, and gifts get forgotten. So what is left after 35 years of celebrating Christmas. Well, I think the text that we're going to consider today will help us see that Christmas can make a lasting impact in our lives. I think Christmas can be meaningful. And I hope that today, if you have never had a truly meaningful Christmas, today your life will change and you will understand what Christmas is truly about. We're going to look at Luke 1, 46 through 54 today. That's our text for today. Luke 1, 46 through 54 contains the prayer of Mary. This is Mary's famous song. 
It's called the Magnificat. The term Magnificat comes from the first Latin word of the, of the Latin version of the song. Magnificat anima mea dominium. In other words, my soul magnifies the Lord. Magnificat simply means I magnify, I exalt. If you think of a magnifying glass, you make great, right? So my soul makes great, my soul boasts, my soul exalts the Lord. The Magnificat is a song of praise to God for what he has done. In other words, looking back. But the Magnificat is also a song of faith that God will do great things. So in other words, looking forward. And you see, this is the foundation of the Christian walk. We look back and see that God is always faithful. So then we can look forward and know that God will remain faithful. Therefore, our faith must never rest on our circumstances, but on God's faithfulness. A bit of background on this song. The Magnificat, the Song of Mary, comes at the end of an interaction that Mary had with her cousin, with her older cousin, Elizabeth. Mary was pregnant with the Lord Jesus, and Elizabeth, her cousin, was pregnant with John, who would eventually be known as John the Baptist. You see, these two women, and these two babies, and these two wombs, are here representing the encounter of the old covenant with the new covenant. Elizabeth the older was pregnant with the last of the prophets of old. He would speak on behalf of God. Mary, very young, was pregnant with one who would speak as the Lord. John, the son of Elizabeth, would call the people to obey the law of God. Jesus would fulfill the law of God for the people. John would be born of a woman beyond the ages of childbearing. God bringing life out of hard and difficult circumstances. The Song of Mary is very similar to the Song of Hannah in 1 Samuel. The barren one has been given a son who will save his people. But although Elizabeth had a child beyond the ages of childbearing. Jesus would be born of a virgin. In Jesus' case, this is no longer God bringing life out of difficult circumstances. In Jesus' case, God brings life out of impossible circumstances. And this word, difficult circumstances, indeed, Mary, young, pregnant, And yet, unmarried, this is not a good place for a woman, young woman, in first century Palestine. Yet Mary had two things in her heart. She had difficult life circumstances, yes, that is true. But she had a God-given promise as well. So how does Mary respond to this? How does Mary respond to difficult circumstances against God-given promises? Mary sings for joy. Mary sings with a heart that is full of joy. You see, the circumstances of life, the uncertainty of life, paled before the promise of an ever Faithful God. So what does Mary do? Mary sings. And she sings for joy. 
So our guiding question today as we go through this text is this. What is Mary's source of joy? Where does Mary find this joy? Friends, and here's why this is so important. Because we need joy. We need joy in the face of life's difficult circumstances. And I think Mary today models faith and joy in the midst of difficult circumstances. So I'm going to read the text now. You can follow along with me. It's Luke 1, 46 through 54. And here's what it says. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble state of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done a great thing for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud with the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those with humble states. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Let's pray. Father, would you today teach us about the joy that can only come from you? Would you help us behold the God of Mary, her Savior. And would you help us see his faithfulness? And would you teach us to trust in him and in him alone? I pray this, Lord, knowing that you can wake up even the dark hearts, the dead hearts of those who have come in here today not wanting you, but your word is powerful. So we pray that just as you brought life out of impossible circumstances, you would bring about life today in hearts that are hearts of stone and that you would turn them into hearts of flesh. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, so we're going to see throughout the text, we're going to see Three ways in which Mary rejoices in God. And we're going to see how we can learn from that. So what is Mary's source of joy? First of all, Mary rejoices in God who considers the humble. Mary rejoices in God who considers the humble. Verse 46, when it opens, it says, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary expresses her joy here in the Lord in two ways. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God. These are parallel ways. These are two ways of saying the same thing. She's reinforcing the fact that her soul magnifies the Lord with a sentence, and my spirit rejoices in God. To magnify God is to rejoice in Him. To praise God is to enjoy Him. To worship God is to love Him. But then at the end of these two sentences, she adds the words, my Savior. It is the first hint that we get from Mary that she is humble. She recognizes that she would be lost without God's saving grace. Mary sings because she recognizes that she has received a merited grace. One of the greatest motivations we can find to worship God is the recognition that we have received a merited grace. Though we deserved hell, Because of our disobedience, God has granted us heaven. 
Friends, if you walk into this church, and when we open up with song, you find it hard to sing, and you find it hard to open your lips and join the voices of this congregation in praise to our God, I would encourage you to examine your heart. Have you received unmerited grace from God? Has God saved you out of the domain of darkness and has transported you to the kingdom of his beloved son? Have you experienced God's forgiveness in your life? If you have, if you have, how can you not sing amazing love? How can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? You see, the greatest motivation for worship, for congregational singing, is not a phenomenal band, even though we have very talented musicians in this church. It's not playing the top 40 Christian songs in the radio station. The greatest motivation for congregational singing and for heartfelt singing are regenerate hearts. Our hearts that look at God and say, indeed, you have been good to me. Indeed, you have saved me. Understanding that unmerited grace has been given. Grace, by definition, is unmerited. Do you recognize God's favor in your life? Do you recognize that God has saved you? Then sing. Then sing for joy. Don't sing for me. Sing for God. Sing because God has done great things for you. If you have a hard time singing, that might be an indication that your heart is not regenerated. If you have a hard time proclaiming the gospel through song, this might be an indication that you're not saved and that you have not experienced unmerited grace from God. But the good news is this. This can change right now. You can right now place your faith in Christ and you can indeed sing that thou, my God, has died for me. So let the worship of God's people be a thermometer for your heart. Let the worship of God's people remind you that it is out of response from God's grace that we worship. Mary reminds us that God considers the humble. Look at verse 48. For he has looked on the humble state of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generation will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done a great thing for me, and holy is his name. Mary is humble. She points to God for the great things that had happened and that will happen in her life. But why does God care so much about humility? Why is it so important for God that we are humble? I mean, I think the question of humility is a question that should put all of us a little bit uncomfortable. Right? Because if we are to answer truthfully, none of us are humble. But God cares about it. He opposes the proud and he exalts the humble. Why is this question so important? And here's why. Because the truly humble will always lead you to direct your praise to God. The truly humble will point to God. The truly humble will tell you, it's not within me. It's God works. It's God working through me. You know, I had a conversation with a young man from this church recently, and I was just thanking him because of his servant heart. And he had done an extremely great selfless job in something that we were doing here at the church. And he responded to me this way, I wouldn't be able to do this if Christ didn't work in me. What a godly response, right? What an incredibly godly response. You see, what he didn't do that is that he didn't deny that something good was done, right? But instead, 
He said something good was done, and you know who deserves the credit for it? Christ does. You see, that is true humility. True humility is to recognize the good that has been done and praise God for it. Look at the pronouns that Mary uses in verses 48 and 49. For he has looked on the humble state. For behold, not all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done a great thing for me. And holy is his name. Do you see what Mary does? It's like Mary's taking a spotlight and is pointing back to God. God is saying, yes, I am blessed. Yes, I am favored. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to God. So, my question to you is this. Are you quick to recognize God when you receive a blessing? Are you quick to respond in thanksgiving when your prayers are answered? So often we pray so ardently for things, and when we receive them, we don't give thanks. We often enjoy the gifts more than the gift giver. Because our hearts, friends, are bent inwards. And once we receive the benefits, just like the ten lepers, only one return to give thanks to Christ. So, are we really receiving and thanking God for the blessings that he gives us? Now, before I go on any further, I need to open a parenthesis here. Because some of you might be thinking or might be asking the question, why is a Baptist church preaching a sermon about Mary? Right? Why is a Baptist preacher preaching a sermon about Mary? I thought only Catholics did that. Right? Perhaps some of you are asking that question. Let me tell you something. This is not a sermon about Mary. This is a sermon about Mary's God. The God whom she calls my Savior. The Bible refers to Mary as favored, so we ought to refer to Mary as favored. The Bible refers to Mary as blessed, so we ought to refer to Mary as blessed. The Bible calls Mary the Father of our Lord, so we ought to call Mary the Father of our Lord. But the Bible refers to Mary in those terms because of the fruit of her womb. Not because of her, but because of the one she carries. See, Mary is honored in the Bible, but there is a limit to Mary's exaltation. Christ himself puts a limit to how much Mary ought to be exalted. Jesus was teaching once, and we have this story out of the Gospel of Luke, verse 11. Chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. And somebody screams out. Listen to the story. And he said these things, as he said these things, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. So in other words, Jesus is teaching and somebody raises praises to Mary. And this is not wrong, right? We know that she is blessed. We know that Mary has honored, but Jesus instead redirects that honor and redirects that praise to a greater object of honor, to one who ought to really be praised. But he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So Jesus is saying, Mary is honored, but there is a limit to how we ought to honor Mary. If Mary was here today, she will tell us, don't trust in me, trust instead in my son. We must have a biblical view of Mary. We must honor her in the same way the Bible honors her. 
We must steer clear of the danger of thinking of Mary as divine because the Bible only attributes the divine to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We must stay clear from that. Mary is not our mediator before God. The Bible says that there is one mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ, the man. So to attribute that which is Christ's to Mary is idolatry. So that's one end of it, right? We must not idolize Mary. We must honor her with words that the Bible allows us to use. But on the other hand, we must not downplay the importance that the Bible places on Mary. Look at this passage out of Isaiah 66. Isaiah 66 two says this, But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. This verse describes Mary so well. She is humble. Mary is a humble woman. But she is humble because her spirit is contrite. Because her spirit is broken. Mary recognizes God as her Savior. That is the root of her humility. But Mary also trembles at God's word. Mary has a high regard for God's word. This is a 14, 15 year old girl singing a song and every line from this song is either a quotation or an allusion to an Old Testament passage. Mary knew God's word. And as we go on, we're going to see that Mary was a phenomenal theologian. She understood how God worked with his people. So what can we learn from Mary here in this first point? Are you proud of your accomplishments in life? Or are you thankful to God for his favor towards you? Friends, the antidote to pride is thankfulness. Do you want to kill your pride? Be thankful. Do you want to kill the pride in your heart? Be thankful to God. It is not denying the blessed one has received that kills pride, but it is recognizing the giver of the blessing. Right? Have you ever met someone who has fake humility? Right? They kind of downplay compliments so that you can give some more. Oh, I'm not that good. No, no, no. Yeah, keep talking, keep talking. Yeah, keep talking about me, right? Have you ever met someone like that? Friends, that's fake humility. Fishing for compliments. Fishing for, fishing for praise is fake humility. True humility comes when we recognize, I am blessed. But I am blessed because God has blessed me. Do you recognize God's blessings in your life? And do you turn them into praise? Do you worship God for the way he's worked in your life? Here's another question. I want to go a little deeper in your heart with this question. Would those around you, this is a diagnostic question, would those around you label you as proud or as thankful? Those who know you well, Would your wife or your husband say that you're proud? Or would they say that you are a thankful person? How do your children view you? How do your co-workers view you? Do they recognize humility that points to God? Or do they see in you self-exalting pride? Friends, let's strive to kill the pride for the glory of God. Let's strive to kill the pride in our hearts for the glory of God and for the good of those around you. Did you know that? That our pride affects those around you 
and our pride robs God of His glory. So let us examine our hearts and let us kill our pride so that we'll truly love God rightly and so that we'll truly love those around us rightly. But Mary goes on then to demonstrate to us that she rejoices in God, this is point number two, who defends the weak. We're going to see that in verses 50 through 53. Listen to this beautiful language in verse 50. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. Do you hear the general invitation here? It's open. Do you want to receive God's mercy? Fear him. And you receive his mercy. His mercy has been available to all who fear him for centuries and centuries and centuries. From generation to generation. God has always worked the same way with his people. Faith. Do you trust him? Do you fear him? If you fear him and you trust him, you are his. The mercy of God is available for everyone. And I wonder if you're here today, sitting in this church, thinking, I'm just not worthy of receiving God's favor. God could never consider me. Maybe you like church. Maybe you say in your heart, I would love to be a Christian. But I carry too much baggage. I've done too many things. Let me tell you this. If that is you, you are at the right place today. God did not come to save those who do not feel the burden of their sin. God came to save people like you who feel the burden and the weight of their sin. And he's saying to you today, cast your burdens on me because I care for you. God came to save people who carry guilt and shame. God made a way through his son so that he can deal with guilt, so that he could love the ashamed, so that he could heal the sick, and so that he could forgive the sinner. If any of these things describes you, God wants you to come to him today. If I'm describing you, you're not here today by chance. God has ordained your steps so that you would hear the gospel. And God is telling you today for your shame, for your guilt, for the burdens you carry, my son came, lived, died, and resurrected. Christ can be yours. There's no sin too great for his grace. Mary goes on in verse 51. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble state. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. These are kind of strange things to say about a pregnancy, right? Can you, can you imagine the phone call? Hey, mom, I'm pregnant. You know what that means? That means that God has brought down the mighty from their thrones, right? God has exalted the humble. Hey, mom, I'm pregnant. That means the hungry are filled with good things and the rich are sent away empty. This is a very strange conversation for a pregnant woman to have, right? What is Mary talking about here? What is, what is so peculiar about this pregnancy that causes her to speak of such grandiose things? Mary is not here speaking merely of her experience of being pregnant. Mary is talking here about the great Reversal. You can fill that in. Mary's talking about what her son would accomplish through his birth 
life, death, and resurrection. Jesus came to right every wrong. Jesus came to oppose the proud and to set them low and to exalt the humble. This song is very much about the reversal that this world so need. Notice how Mary speaks of things that would happen, but she does so in the past tense, right? Her son would come and create a great reversal, would right every wrong, would exalt the humble and humble the proud. But she says he has already shown strength. He has already scattered the proud. He has already brought down the mighty. He has already exalted those in humble state. He has already filled the hungry. He's already done all these things. Mary is speaking here out of faith. She trusted God and God's promise so much. What God said he would do was as sure as something that was already done. You see, friends, that is faith. Faith is the essence of things that cannot be seen. So our faith is exercised when we look at the world and we say, though the world is this way, God will right every wrong. Though this world is filled with injustices, God the just will fix it and he will bring about justice. Do you have faith in this God? Do you walk through hardship trusting that ultimately no sin will go unpunished? No wrongdoing will remain uncovered? Look at the verses. Look at verses 51 through 53 again. God in his strength confuses the proud in his own thinking. He brings down the strong but he exalts the humble. In verse 53, he gives good things to the hungry and withholds blessings from the rich. I don't think verse 53 is an indictment on the rich. One can be wealthy and honor God, right? Job was blameless and very wealthy. God blesses many people with great wealth in the Bible. I do not think Mary is talking about here actual rich people and actual poor people. Okay? Although it is true that riches, right? Riches can keep us from coming to God because by nature, those who have little run towards hope and those who have much hope in their own things. It is easier for a wealthy person to be proud. That is true. So, if you are wealthy among us, do not be proud. Do not be proud because if you are wealthy, that's a gift that you have been given. Instead of be proud, being proud, be thankful. Be generous. Be kind. The poor, by virtue, by virtue of his circumstances, are often humble. So that is true. But I think Mary is again using an illustration to depict what her son would eventually do. He would right the wrong. He would undo the, justice, the injustice. God knows that this world is not fair. God knows this world, that this is a world where the weak suffers and the wicked often seems to prosper. God knows that. If you're suffering, God knows you're suffering. Psalm 53 says that God keeps every tear you shed in a bottle. He does not forget it. He knows. But he also wants you to know that though this world is wrong, though the world, this world we live, we live in, seems often so wrong. He is the ruler yet. 
In other words, this hymn is reminding us that God is not done. God is not done. He will bring about justice. Do you think there are wrongs that need to be made right in this world? If you watch the news, I'm sure you would agree that there are. Have you experienced injustice in your life? Are you right now suffering unjustly? Has someone wronged you? Don't get bitter. Don't lose hope. Trust that God is keeping tabs of all wrongdoing in this world. And in the day of the Lord, everyone will give account of everything. From the worst dictators to your co-worker who is spreading false rumors about you. On the other hand, perhaps you've been unjust. Perhaps you are not being honest at your job. Perhaps you intend to lie in your income tax. Perhaps you are lying to your spouse right now about a secret lifestyle. Younger folks, perhaps you have put a facade of obedience with your parents, but, you're li but you live a completely different lifestyle around your friends and on social media. I want to remind you that you are not fooling God. God is not fooled by your fake lifestyle. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. And he knows your wickedness. You do not fool God. So God wants you today to repent. Turn from your sin. Come clean and trust Jesus. God wants you to change. God wants you to promote justice in this unjust world. And what would this trust in God look like in a practical way? Well, first of all, if you desire justice but you have not repented of your sins and trusted in Christ, you do not want God to exercise His justice over you because God will deal with you according to your sins. So friends, if that's you today, today is the day of salvation for you. God can forgive your sins through His Son. His Son came, took on flesh, humbled Himself. He lived a life of suffering, tempted in all things, but He did not sin. He died a death, and in His death, He took on the sins of all who would trust in Him. And by resurrecting, God the Father said, if anyone will put his trust in my son, his perfection will be your perfection. So if you want justice, first go to the cross. Because it is at, it is at the cross that love and justice meet. And it is by coming to the cross that God will not deal with you according to your righteousness, but he will deal with you according to Christ's righteousness. So stop trying to earn God's favor apart from Christ. Give up. You can't do it. Christ has done it for you. Now finally, we're going to see that Mary rejoices in God who remembers his people. We're interested in the section that actually Mary is a very good theologian. Verse 54, she says, He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. And he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring. This verse has two descriptions of who God's people is. In verse 54, the first half, Mary calls God's people his servant Israel. And then she goes on in the second half of verse 55 to say that God's people are the offspring of Abraham. And then she describes two ways in which God deals with his people. Two ways in which God remembers his people. He remembers his people with 
mercy, withholding, deserving punishment. And she, and she also says that God deals with his people in the same way that he spoke with our fathers. God has purpose to show mercy to you, if you're God's people, to you, Christian, for millennia. He didn't start thinking of you yesterday. You did not stumble into God's plan of salvation by chance. He has brought you to it all along. Through your trials and successes, through your pain and joy, God has orchestrated your life, Christian, to bring you to Him so that He would show you mercy. Is that not an incredible display of love? God orchestrates our life for our good. Now, there's a lot of Old Testament language here. So an obvious question might be, I'm not a Jew. So what does this have to do with me? Perhaps most of us here are not ethnically Jewish. So we're looking at all these promises to Israel, all these promises to Abraham. Does it apply to me? Does it have anything to do with me? What does Mary's song have to do with me as God's people? Galatians 3, 7 says this. Know then that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. The offspring of Abraham are those of faith. In the New Testament, the people of God is not defined by nationality, by ethnicity, but by its faith. There is, this is why we can have a pastor in an English-speaking church who sounds funny. Because I don't have to be like you to be your brother and sister. I have to have the same Savior. That's what makes God's people God's people. It is the faith in Christ. The church is the Israel of God, Paul tells the Galatians. Jesus is the offspring of Abraham, Paul also tells the Galatians. Perhaps you should go home today and read Galatians. Read the whole book, 15 minutes, and see how it is by faith that we're made people of God. So by faith, the blessings of Israel are now given to the church. We are the Israel of God. God has planned to save the church all along. From the very beginning, he loved her church. Since the church is found in Christ. We are the Israel of God. We are the offspring of Abraham. And all the promises of God, since Christ is the faithful Israel, are ours through him. So we can know that God has loved us for a long time. Brothers and sisters, God has loved you for a long time. Your existence in this world is not by chance, but God purposed you to be who you are, just like you are, the way you are. He loves you, and He has loved you for a long time. Listen to how God speaks to His people in the book of Deuteronomy. Now, keep in mind, Old Testament, ethnic Israel, New Testament, Israel by faith. But look at how God speaks to his people. Deuteronomy 7. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, God has a special love for his church, the Israel of God. It was not because you were more in numbers than any of the people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. In other words, it is not because of anything within you. Apart from Christ, you're not special. But in Christ, you're infinitely special. 
for you are the fewest of all people. Verse 8. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. In the Old Testament, Israel is brought out of physical slavery. In the New Testament, we are redeemed out of slavery to our sins. So friends, God has been working with us for a long time. What a great demonstration of mercy. What a great demonstration of love. Everlasting love. His love will not fail. He will not let you go. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So, Sheridan Hills, may this Christmas not be one that you will forget. May you find your joy in knowing that God's love displayed in Jesus Christ is with you. Let's pray together.